All right, so we will start. And today I had you reading excerpts, a lot of short excerpts from an article about global advertising, about dysfunctional society, and then the entire article about deceiving the third world, the myth of catching up development. And then I also had attached another article that a student sent me, and it was long, and I did not require you to read it, but Rossi has read it, and, and she's going to run out of juice on her machine before the hour is over. So we're going to start with Rossi talking about social media, and I want all of the rest of you, I'm going to ask you after she's done to give your own examples. So in this class, we probably will do four rounds of students reacting to each of the four articles. Uh, again, you didn't have to read the article, but the article just gives a lot of research and it gives you a much broader perspective on a problem. And, um, and that, that's important, right? So the difference between the article and the, my class is that the article gives you perspective about Facebook, you know, so that your own personal experiences are not just yours. My class gives you this much broader perspective, right? How did we get into this mess in the first place? And what were the intellectual leaders thinking? And what are they thinking now? And then what, how do you need to think moving forward? So the article Rossi reports on will tell you don't think like the Facebook post, but my, my you know, idea is that you would get a philosophy. You would have a much broader philosophy about how to think about everything and also about how to live your life in, uh, in relation to many, many different aspects of life. So I give you the broadest perspective and other scholars give you, you know, different perspectives, but I think they all end up in similar places. It's just that as you live your life moving forward, I hope that you will have read enough uh, material and done enough research so you can connect your immediate experience to the broader context. That's, that's the liberal arts education part of, your, of the AUW curriculum. So Rossi, did she disappear? Oh my gosh, I was about to call on her and she disappeared. <laughs> uh, no, anyway, all right. We will start with the advertising. And as, when Rossi gets on, which I hope she does, but if she doesn't, she doesn't, and we will move on. Um, okay, here's my outline. And okay, so the first article, global advertising. When the internet first came into being, it was used by it tended to be used by people who were more educated and they tended to use it for educational purposes. Um, that was true with TV too, television. Oh, people can be more educated than ever. <laughs> and then of course it got dumbed down and it got commercialized and it appeals to all sorts of fantasies and phobias. And there are good shows on TV, but you have to really know what you're looking for. Well, the same thing happens with, you know, every cable TV, the same thing happens with every wave, I think. So it just gives you responsibility. Educated, um, educated people need to be responsible. Um, so human communications has been commercialized. 
So when my grandsons are on their machines, I don't know if I've actually said this to them, but I probably will someday. Um, I'll just say, look, Emiliano, somebody is just trying to sell you something, you know, every time you go onto that thing. So be careful, right? You're just becoming an extension of a machine and a machine that was structured by somebody who wants to make money. So how much of your mind are you going to allow to be concentrating on something with those kind of motives, that kind of foundation? Um, the big story in the future is going to be the economic wars, especially the war between the US and China. But um, it's interesting because war is taking on a different form, two different forms. There was always economic competition, but now the stakes will be higher because it will be wars for resources, for clean water, for um, uh, food. And the stakes are going to get higher, but, but the milit military part of war is, is turned into cyber war. So the wars are way different and they are played out mostly on computers and technology in the cloud. Um, the uh, people who defend the economic system still have these same, same old justifications, right? That, that the reason for ads is to increase business growth, which is good, of course, to give people jobs, which is great, of course, and to unify humanity, right? There are people who think, yeah, nobody will be religious after this because they'll see that religion is, you know, weaponized. People who accept religion are nutcakes. Uh, we can uh, bond together by drinking Coca-Cola. <laughs> And, you know, they believe that stuff. So, um, the, of course, the author says, no, it's like a parasite that attaches itself to a living body and sucks the blood out until it kills the host. Um, so is overconsumption this disease, right, that is going to kill the earth, suck all the blood out of the earth. Um, the purpose of advertising. At one point, it was information, and now truly they are manufacturing desires. You don't know that you need this, or, you know, your skin isn't light enough. You didn't know that, but I'm telling you that now, right? Um, and for each of these points, I do want you to think of your own example. So I am going to hold you, hold your feet to the fire, right? Each of you should be able to come up with at least three things to say. Um, women are targeted. Okay, women, is it true that you feel targeted in advertising? Does advertising appeal to your insecurities, your self-doubt, or... The point is to make women unhappy with themselves. Well, the other side of it is, is it clear that men or your friends or whatever have bought into that? So they make you insecure. So if you are treated as not good enough, then in some sense, it's a reasonable response to buy a product. Um, if somebody, if it will make you more secure, if somebody has confirmed that you will be more secure if you buy this product, right? So some of that isn't just women, you know, being made to feel just out of a vacuum. Sometimes it is literally in their relationships. Um, it sells a lifestyle or a fantasy or an identity, glorifies the individual, and it has led to the erosion of neighborhoods 
to more mobility. All right, so here's a really important point that on the one hand, AUW does take women out of their neighborhoods. It aims toward women who have mobility. They aren't necessarily going to go back, at least not for a while, right? But it definitely does not want to feed um, consumption and um, compensation for that. Instead, they want to create this community of women who are creating a new level of culture, but it really is culture. It's forming for the sake of the well being of the women. And then they're um, uh, educating, getting educated to promote the well being of others. So it isn't necessarily bad that people leave their neighborhoods and are mobile, right? It's only bad if it's for the wrong reason and in the wrong way. But if you really want your communities to grow, to become more green, to become more informed, you also need to have people leave and be mobile and then come back. Um, all right, so I, I allowed all of you to share the screen. So each of you might be looking at your screen um, on your own, but I really want to at least stare at this box. I don't want to be staring at my outline. It might end up that I will go back to that. But um, I'm going to call on each of you now for which of those points do you want to react to? Um, and I would prefer if you had one, two, or three points that you wanted to make. So Ramisha, what, what have you got? Um, actually, Professor, uh, I did not read the articles, but I just scanned. So the first article is mainly focusing about the uh, ecological critique of global advertising. So especially, I think uh, advertising uh, motivates people to buy products uh, by uh, conveying, uh, they give useful information and uh, and it uh, talk about the uh, about product and the service choices. So I think uh, the adver advertisements they have a positive advertising and a, a negative advertising as well. Uh, so I think uh, they mainly uh, they use uh, girls and women for their uh, advertisements to uh, promote their advertisements. Uh, I think they uh, mainly use uh, uh, nudity photos to uh, impress uh, the people uh, to buy their products. Maybe I think they use that uh, criteria and I think it's damaged. I think uh, it comes from the Western uh, culture. So I think it's damaged our, uh, the identity of, identity of our culture. All right, so can you give some examples? Uh, I mean, you must look at these ads or you must know about them. What are they trying to sell to women? Okay, um, do you think women where you live do you think their minds have been colonized? In other words, they're buying into a, a standard of beauty that's really Western women and not women in your country? I think uh, their mindset is uh, colonized. So mainly, uh, I think they um, take uh, some, you know, uh, like 
they think about the western culture and they try to uh, influence from that culture i think so okay that would be colonizing their minds right yeah yeah okay so that'll come up again but again can you think of any specific example i know that there are these lotions that bleach your skin uh, but can you think of any other examples okay I love sorry no you can't think of any uh, no okay professor. okay um okay so now we have rossi and um rossi is going to present about the article um about social media so go ahead rossi and so we... i am yeah i am going to try my best because i've been disconnected like four times now in the like in 25 minutes so regarding the article on social media what i found interesting was the research saying that tiktok and facebook is a bit different because tiktok has access to all of our information from our phone so any text messages we send or any information that we have on our phone they are going to use that and create just a for you page and kind of like a section dedicated just for the user and may, uh, and this allows the user to like it while facebook has an algorithm that will only show you posts with content similar to the ones that you like and i find this interesting because recently in cambodia there's two events going on one is relating to the environmental activists being accused of causing terror terrorism or instability in society and another event is relating to a Chinese business guy who owns a lion. And then the well, oh, Wildlife Alliance came in to rescue that lion and put it back into um, the wilderness uh, sanctuary. And so in TikTok, all that people see is not the environmental accusation that's going on with the environmentalists. And these people have the potential of staying in jail for lives or having their lives ended but they only care about the lion situation and like asking authorities to let that chinese guy get the lion back because that's all that that's the only information that's in their phone and it's the same thing for facebook like the environmental issue is so important but no one seems to care about because the popularity is with the lion situation. So if I, I, if I scroll my friend's Facebook account, all I see is the lion thing because that's all that she's been liking and sharing. While on my account, there's just um, content related to the environmental activists and like where's the case at now in trial. And this just shocked me because only a small percentage of Cambodian actually care about the environmental situation and like the majority who's just going with the trend or going with the mass, they only get inform like stupid information and stupid like creating this stupid trend of wanting the lion back when like the lion should belong in the sanctuary but they are voicing their like opinion for the wrong cause you know what I mean like they voice their opinion and they raise their opinion, asking authority to give the lion back to the Chinese business guy. But have they ever thought of like, does that lion even want to stay in the house, being like, oh, like having someone shower for them and giving them like cooked meat to eat, like it's and taking away their claws and stuff. It's out of their nature and it's just harming that lion and that lion is really skinny and unhealthy mm -hmm. and based on the evaluations from the wildlife wilderness like that lion is in a critical stage yet no one chooses to care about those information and all they care about is the trend of getting the lion back to their owner and asking if it, asking the government to allow other rich people okay uh, I think everybody understands, I hope, 
because wisdom is being able to keep everything in perspective. That's number one. And it's really hard. And especially after COVID, AUW students, they really need to develop that discipline of, okay, there's this obstacle and that obstacle, but I, I want to think ahead. I want to get the degree. I want to find a meaningful job. I want to give back. So you have to have literally a 10 year plan instead of a 10 minute reaction. But those, you know, Facebook, TikTok, it will trigger you. It will trigger fantasies, phobias, reactions, and it will completely trivialize your life. And the part of your brain that will be working will be um, just, it, it disappears. It's not meaningful. It doesn't last. So philosophy is about really changing your character so you have a strong and stable character and you can handle immediate problems in the context of long range problems and your long range goals. Is that, is that okay, Rossi? Does that uh, sort of describe Dr. Beck, I'm really sorry, but I got disconnected like half of the time. So I have no idea what you're talking about. And <laughs> I was talking and then I got disconnected and like your, my screen froze for a long time. And then when I came back, you were like talking about like onto something and I'm like, I have no idea. Okay, Rossi, here's the quick version. <laughs> What's most immediate is not important. What's most important is broader, right? The whole yeah. philosophy tradition that you've, I taught you in the class, your plans for life 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line, you're anticipating climate change so you don't panic. That's what matters. And all we care about is something that comes and goes very immediate, very trivial. Um, yeah, that's okay. very true. Okay, so you have this um, survival instinct, fear or outrage, right? Well, you can direct it toward a lion that some businessman wanted, or you can direct it toward the global economic system and how we're going to completely restructure it. Does that make sense, Rossi? I think I lost her again, but I think so. All right. Kanij, what would you like to say about what the article said about advertising? Uh, I think um, I will go for the purpose and um, information via magnific magnificator desire because um, what I see from the childhood to till now is that in as advertisement people are um, sharing a really amazing and good features um, and the information about that products so people are like more encouraged to buy that and when they can uh, collect uh, people's, uh, what does it say, concentrations about the product, and then people will buy it more and they can produce that product more. So that is um, the only purpose for advertising, I think, in my opinion. Well, I want you to distinguish between good advertising that actually gives you information you need and bad advertising that makes you think you can't be happy unless you buy something you don't need, right? Um, yeah, but um, I think it's, a, in my opinion, I think it's good for like, uh, for good and bad advertising. Like, Give me an uh, example, that's all. I, I need some examples, yeah. Okay, so uh, here is an example, like, uh, a product just as fair and lovely as my friend said before. We talk about a lot about this product. So 
I I saw that these products always give like unique features, or it's it's claimed that it will make your skin really white. But honestly, it doesn't do that much. But in television, it shows like it will work like a magically. So this is the things like, but people are also really believing that this is stupid things, and they are really buying a lot of things, of fair and lovely. So this is how people are partnering to buy others to uh, buy their products, and this is how they can also produce more. Like if they can sell more fair and lovely, then also they will products more for the import. Right, so this is how it's work for the advertisement purpose. Right, but the the colonizing of your mind is that you agree that you want lighter skin, right? That yeah, yeah, that's, that's the ultimate. That the Western woman is the standard of beauty, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, so can you think of another product? Right, because I know about the skin whitener, but what there must be, I can't believe you don't have a half a dozen examples off the top of your head that, you know, would come to mind if you just think about them. Oh, well, um, if you want to know about other, other products, then I think there are a lot of products like that, such as, uh, you know, cosmetics, women cosmetics. And also, um, what are these? Um, and and some kind of food also, such as, such as uh, if you say small small packs of noodles in Bangladesh, they used to give like some kind of bowl or like a glass or like a container. So it's also some kind of pursuing. It's showing that if you buy that noodles, then you will get that container. So people buy more that noodles, though it's not good taste, but just for the bowl or the container, people buy it. So when people uh, will buy it, then the company can be able to make the more products. And same with the cosmetics, like people know that if you use cosmetics and makeup for a long time, it's, it's cause that is type of cancer in the skin, but it's still girls are do that. So. <laughs> that's 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 another kind of things i think in my opinion that's good yeah. so the, okay the other level would be do your friends who are girls if you don't wear cosmetics do they comment on that right how come you're not wearing makeup or do boys say that right that would yeah. mean, right that would mean that the mind has been colonized it's not just one decision about what to to buy or use it's a whole yeah, yeah okay yeah all right does that make sense to you yeah it makes sense to me thanks sure because okay in my country they'll sell uh, uh, an attitude or a lifestyle but in your countries, it's even deeper than that. It's the colonizing of the mind. It's you accept that your race doesn't look as pretty, right? Some racial features. So you're basically accepting a, kind, a very superficial level of racism, but it's racism, right? Yeah. Okay. And that's not true in my opinion. You still obsessed with it, like they are really, really connected with it. Like they, they, they didn't realize that it's colonized their their mind, their perspective, and it's it, it's not good. It's it, it's terrible for nations, but it's still people don't understand it. They are like blind. They don't see anything. They just say, oh, it's okay, it's fine. They are something like that. Yeah, actually, if you wanted to give them an example. It used to be that African-American women in the US were always trying to straighten their hair. And they would put, they would, I mean, they would really torture themselves to put some kind of hot, pour hot water. I mean, I don't even remember, but they wanted straight hair, right? And now they don't. 
So if you want to just use that, it's a very visual example of how African-Americans used to try to look white or look more like Europeans, and now they don't, like they've gotten over it. Does that make sense, Kanij? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that's more like it. <laughs> right, that's, you know, how do you argue with people? Um, and you could just say, well, do you think African-Americans with fuzzy hair are pretty? And I assume they'd probably say, well, yeah, or I don't think about it. Well, if you just let yourself be yourself, you would be amazed after a while, people will accept it and they will realize you're just as pretty, <laughs> right? That's, that's the truth, but that's very true. Like everyone is thinking in their way, but there is the word, like everyone's have been colonized with something like, there is something stuck in people said like if i am beautiful but i want to be more beautiful other things by following others i i don't think it's good to following others to be beautiful so right. that's the point. yeah and if you could start a movement you know it's a kind of non-violent uh you know movement a social movement where enough women refuse to try and look western and, and uh, gradually it will dawn on people, well, why should they, right? So anyway, I'm glad you understand that. It may, it's- Yeah, I understand. It's a complicated thing. If we discuss like whole day, so the time will gone, but the discussion will not be ever in. It's just a way to live an active life rather than a passive life, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's just the main thing. You can't worry about, how many people are on your side? It's going to make a difference. You just decide, you get up in the morning, what am I going to do? How am I going to live my life? Um, and you do have sisters at AUW who probably will agree with you. So I think you always have somebody. If, when you go to AD, AUW, you're going to be able to find uppity women. Like you're not going to be alone, right? So that's... Yeah. That's, that really is important. You know, when you feel all alone in your neighborhood, it's, that's a lot harder. Um, okay, so Jamie, did you, could you think of some example or some follow-up on one of the comments from the ad, the article about advertising? Okay. So as I said, uh, if, if a student doesn't respond and doesn't chat, I've got to look, put a little circle around their name. So, um, all right. What about Anindita? Okay. What about Soda? Hi, hello. Am I audible, Professor? Yes. Huh, okay. Um, so for me, there was like quite a lot of things from this article that I thought was important. Um, so, well, we already talked about some of them. Uh, so I'll just briefly mention. You don't them. have to be brief. There are very few students. So, you know, <laughs> go ahead. I mean, I would like you to pick a lot of points so the other students can understand that you're perfectly capable of this, right? I'm not asking um, rocket science. So go ahead. So um, the first one that I read, wrote, read was like that, dangers of social media and science. And uh, the one thing, okay, so I, Rossi was also talking about uh, the, the global advertisement and social media a lot. So while like she was talking about TikTok and Facebook and like how uh, all of the trends and information are so personalized to us. So everyone kind of like lives in their own bubble and it's all, it, it's really, you know, a good so concerning. So for internet, we would, Thing that yes you have internet you have social media it's 
easy to find any information that you want. You're more globalized, more informed, and you know, all of that. But in reality, that doesn't work at all because every person, like any individual on the internet, they only look for things that they're interested in or they use when they're bored and they are only looking at things that are advertised to them. And all of the social media, each pl platform works, works like that, that everyone is just, the platform is pushing to you what they think is attractive to you, what, what things that you will spend more time on. So they work like, uh, they just work for clicks. So how long they, they can keep your attention? how long, how much of your time they can take. So as long as you can, like before, I think, well, when, like, even when I was little, there was no, like, uh, there was a, like a limit to how much you can scroll. But right now, every social media, all of them, like every social platform, there is no limit. You can, there's infinity scroll. You can scroll by, hours and hours and hours uh, hours and there will be like no end to it unless you have like self-control it's just totally up to you and especially i see it with kids when i see my like nephews use youtube or whatever they're watching on their phone and they as long as we don't take the, their screens away they will just keep on with it doesn't matter how many hours they've been on it and it's for adults, at least they have that uh, mindset or that self-restraint, but kids, they don't. And they can just spend their whole day on it without any supervision. And it, for kids, they don't uh, have that ability to just like search or be conscious about what they're watching or anything, they don't know what's good for them either. So it's just an open space. They can watch anything, be exposed to anything. It's, there is no limit. So it just, it's like even more dangerous for them. And about like, it's just really, really concerning to me because especially now, now because of quarantine, there is no school. Kids can go outside to play they're always stuck at home and majority of the time they're on their phones or laptops or like just any kind of screen and I don't know I just like seeing my sister kids I feel like really you know scared that what is this like what kind of environment are they growing up in and like they're not learning anything because the school is totally shut down some of the schools are taking online classes but even then supervising them is it's just not possible to just to watch your kids every second right it's really really you know concerning and even for adults we can't control our impulses how are we going to teach kids right i mean you have to set them? an example right yeah Okay, it's just the thing about it is that I think, you know, if you didn't go to college or if you didn't get into AUW, if you didn't get exposed to liberal arts college, I hope that you understand, you know, that you have a responsibility and you could just be their aunt, like Aunt Soda, you know, is a really good student and Aunt Soda doesn't do this stuff. And you can just tell them, there's no way you're going to be able to be a really good student unless you shut things down and concentrate on your study. So, I mean, all of the AUW students could make a big difference in the lives of people, you know, extended family or people whose lives they touch. And the irony of the word free mind, right? is that the most free mind never let social media affect them, right? They always decide. That's why I always ask, tell you, you write the research paper you want to know about because I want you to get in that habit 
of figuring out, well, what do I want to think about, right? What do I want to know? And I want to know it because I know enough that I know I need to know that. And I'll be able to attach that to what I know. And then I'll know I need to know that. And so I can have a free mind means a mind that knows what it needs to know and is very self-motivated. That's the freedom part of it. Whereas your nephews might think they have a free mind because they can go on, you know, and do whatever they want. And then you say, no, no, your mind is enslaved, right? To somebody who's making money off your mind. And you've, you know, you've become, your mind is a consumer product. Somebody has co-opted your mind, which is the worst thing to happen to you. Um, all right, Soda, does that make sense to you? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's like, it's just, it's just uh, for kids, it's really hard to explain it to them or because they're just like you know five to six I years know. old they don't care about anything else they don't they don't even have that concept of you know i know and they won't for that, a while that awareness. yeah i know and if they're already so like addicted to screens and youtube and like social media how would they stop like can they stop when they actually become aware and they have that concept that mindset to understand right like, wouldn't it be like too late by then it's just well, really hard I, yeah i don't really know because you know if people if it dawned on people that everything they've done they've been colonized right their psyche has been colonized by mostly Western economic uh, uh -huh. corporations. Um, and then, you know, just trying to get some self-respect from national self-respect, some, some sense of your own dignity. Just, if you can just get a sense that somebody's using you, you're not really free. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I guess, okay, so that brings to like, the second article which is like deceiving the third world yes. and it's like basically so the talks about colonizing minds and how uh, the western uh, mindset is kind of colonizing everyone else and it's just like uh, it is like very really, like really really it's not easy to see when if you're not looking for it, but it's like everywhere in and all of our cultures, especially like, I don't know, in South Asia, for us, we were like colonized by the British for a while, like over 100 years. And it's just so like, even when I'm thinking about from when I was a kid to now, I can see myself and like I can remember from how my mindset was before and now and how I had to like relearn things and I have to like scrape away some part of like parts of my thinking that was I later realized was so much colonized and influenced by all these really corrupted ideas so you know it's like really really scary when i like think back on it and it's just really i don't know sad and scary to see that so many of the people and like like majority of the people even doesn't even realize that they're, they've been colonized that their mind is still colonized we all think we are free and whatever we're thinking is it's us it comes from us it, we have freedom of mind, like freedom of speech, everything, but we don't. It's just we're brainwashed and we don't even know it. It's really like 
while like we were talking about uh like skin color and everything so there's like different levels of colonizing like uh one is like individual so we're like uh degrading ourselves our individual self and self-worth just uh from the western point of view or co like colonized ideas and then there's the cultural aspect to it so the individual stuff i would say is it's more like you know uh we uh we're all like trying to be more western like the more western you are the more smarter more intelligent or uh more i would know uh like people would perceive you as superior so as much as it's it's just like if you're uh brown or like colored on the uh, outside but you're white on the inside so as much as you can you know whitewash yourself and and you know adapt to western culture and you know show it and you are perceived as superior it's just like this mindset of anything western is good right and it's you, really yeah do you remember that quote from lord macaulay and he went to india and he said these people are amazing you know there's no theft yeah, yeah yeah and he says we've got to destroy their culture right and so soda you could say yeah they did <laughs> right and that's why I also had you read those religious traditions. I mean, the religious traditions themselves have a lot of good things in them. But if if the actual natives are just on their phones all the time or, you know, on their screen, then what happens to religion, right? It just becomes, again, part of your brand, but it's not at all what you care about. It's not part of your character. It's just a way for you to be, um, I don't know, superior, or it's your team. And so, you know, the idea that after people spend all their day on these machines, and yet they would go to the mosque and be self-righteous about what a Muslim they are, it's the same with Christian, okay? They would go to a mega church on Sunday and be so righteous about how Christian they are, it, it's, it's shocking how, how much people can deceive themselves about themselves. And then they use religion in this very perverted way. Does that make sense, Soda? Yeah. And it's just really frustrating to see that, like, how we all, we all have this inferiority complex that it's just, anything if you're not uh just from that like and one thing that was like very prominent was speaking english here so we are like taught english from if uh, from grade one like even when you're in in kindergarten you, you have to learn like you're learning bangla and also english simultaneously and it's just like you'd see anyone who speak doesn't speak english as well they they would instantly would be considered as less smart or less intelligent or if you speak english with an accent you'd be like ah oh, you uh, kids would like make fun of you or something and it's it's just like you'd be perceived as not good enough and all of that and it's just like really i don't know like as, at least for me personally, I would say like when I was growing up, I'd see all of these people trying to sound British and like trying so hard to be uh, white, I would say that they think if they can't, it's it's almost like a, uh, if they are not, it's like kind of they feel panicked somehow that, oh, I, I'm not, I, I accidentally didn't speak in the, the, in the certain accents and it's just like a, such a shameful thing or something 
and it's just so frustrating like why why would you want to like what's wrong with your own accent right why would you have to speak in another accent to seem superior and what why would that even make you superior it doesn't make you smarter or anything else you just all it does is make you feel superior and look down on other people that doesn't speak in that accent and it's just like yeah it's it's bad <laughs> and that's yeah. why i when i say to you i can help you with your english it's i know that language is a tool of hegemony right but the, but you can't fight that so i want to teach you english without at all associating that with superiority so also i do want you to know that the reason i'm teaching western old western powerful white men isn't because i admire them right uh it's because if you don't know how they're thinking you don't know how bad it is does that make sense soda yes so of course i'm not advocating this notion of rationality as self-interest and the lifeboats and that what is posterity i'm saying you know make sure you know how wrong these people are and how much you're gonna suffer for it so i guess i want you to know english and know this history so that you can have many reasons to say we got to get beyond this and we have to build something different um so that's that's my main point i I think you think, I think my students get that, you know, they won't say, oh, Dr. Beck is selling us Western civilization. <laughs> okay, so Shamima, do you have something? All right, so what about Rihanna? Is she there? Okay. What about Fahima? Professor. Yes. I'm here. Oh, good. Hello. Yay. <laughs> a voice in the wilderness. What are you, a goddess? <laughs> something? Okay, go ahead. Professor, mostly my friends talk about the global advertising actually i want to focus the negative impact of the global advertising right nowadays professor most of the time we are as you know we are living in lockdown to, into the uw campus so when we see like from the social media they are advertising so many things which look like totally perfect totally awesome so when we order like something, then we saw like so many things like it was totally different. And like we, for example, you know, professor, like in Bangladesh, like there is one app which is called Dra Daras. Then we order most of the time, whatever we need from there. They advertise like professor, it look like everything is good for example one week ago i ordered one bag sheet and the is belonging with pillow cover but when they send after one week the color is also totally different there is no pillow cover it was like that and when we were in myanmar professor like we don't have much internet connection and we got the internet connection in 2015 those time we can we will be able to use the mobile phone before that we use like from the tv channel we see several kind of the advertising professor i just want to know about during the advertising like most of the time why they use the female why they use what like the most of the time like they advertise with female like <laughs> that's right <laughs> Like, okay, so the yeah. article said why, 
because women are less secure, right? And they're told they have to please men. And so they will buy stuff because they're convinced they need it. Does that make sense? Yeah, Professor. Um, so again, I just think if you have friends that are really keeping their minds focused on what matters, you can inspire each other. And if you really want to go together in a room and look at some of these awful ads and then just joke about it, right? You can, you just find some way not to let that button get punched. That the ad yes, Professor, the like here in one of my development last night, she ordered like Professor one kg, one kilogram mangoes, but <laughs> After like few minutes, she got like that mango. There is like professor only one mango. In one kg, like one a small single mango. We just like making fun with that mango. She was like, she was inviting like six, like we are six friends. She invite all of us with that mango. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I would, the next step is don't buy it at all, right? But, <laughs> You have to really uh, sense of humor, friendships, you know, don't think that you can sit and expose yourself to stuff that is designed to trigger all sorts of conscious and unconscious reactions and think that it's not going to bother you. You know, they spend billions of bucks making sure it bothers you, right? And so I would just say, don't think that you aren't an animal remember i mean the irony yes, of this the irony of this is it goes back to bentham and utilitarianism remember and that whole behavior modification the blank slate we're just like herd animals we respond to pleasure and pain well all of this advertising is taking that weakness of human beings when they're not thinking and it's just flooding them with stuff Pleasure, pain, happiness. Pleasure, pain, happiness, right? They do all this research. Um, so that's not what the original utilitarians had in mind. And that's not what a lot of present day utilitarians have in mind. But the vast majority of um, utilitarian type of, advert, of uh, use of that philosophy is definitely designed to make you uh, mindless, thoughtless, impulsive, fear-driven, fantasy-driven, um, not a human being, just like an, an idiot animal that just responds without any thinking. Um, and, and, you know, that's an insult to animals, uh, but I'm saying you, you treat uh, people as much like animals as you can, and that's how you manipulate them. And the Enlightenment thought that too. It's just the thought, and we'll make them middle class, and we'll make them not greedy, and we'll make them, you know, bond together so they won't be afraid, right? No, no, you could take that same scenario and go, completely the other direction so um does that make sense to you shamima yes okay um so fahima said in the chat um in my country uh makeup products are sold that are expired right beauty project products that are either expired or I would say probably um, exported because they didn't pass uh, certain tests in the developing countries and they sell it cheaper because, and people buy these products and they don't care why they're so cheap, right? And they, you know, the, it's very successful. The companies make a lot of money. But I can give you a more egregious example, a worse example. Um, when I was in college and I got married, when I was in college, which please don't do that, don't do that. 
Uh -uh. Okay. So I, there was a product called an IUD. It was a kind of birth control product. And it turns out they didn't test it appropriately. And it had a string on it that wasn't sealed shut. And so bacteria would go up the string and the uterus would be infected. And so as soon as that was found out in America, the women sued, you know, there were 300,000 women, no, there were just tens of thousands of women filing lawsuits in the US. Those products got exported to developing countries, okay? And, and it was okay, right? The developing countries accepted them, partly because it's another product, but partly because birth control, right? It's better to have something than nothing. So we have no data about how many women had toxic pregnancies or whatever. But that, yeah, I'm sure that happens all the time, is that products that don't pass the Food and Drug Administration in the US are exported because those countries don't have the same standards. Um, so I would, what I would do is like, why buy it in the first place, right? What isn't good enough about you that you would need to buy it? And in particular, I would say things that you put on your skin that your skin absorbs, right? I would be careful. Um, so anyway, that that's all just, you know, part of this problem of what's actually happening with the international economy. And this is without even bringing up environmental destruction per se. But, you know, all of these unnecessary products are destroying the earth. And people in developing countries suffer more for that too. So, you know, somebody could be buying some product and then they, it doesn't arrive because they had a mudslide in their village and they had to get out and they don't see the connection, right? Between all these products and all the fossil, all the, fossil fuel, carbon dioxide into the air it causes. And, you know, the, the deforestation and the mudslides, they're all connected. And I hope, you know, now that we're coming to the end of this class, that you would just develop that eye of your soul, right? So there's colonizing the mind, there's making you want to be like a Westerner and also not noticing how much environmental degradation there is and how much you and your countries pay a way higher price than Westerners do. So I'm going to let you, I'm going to take a break, right? For 15, oh, Connie, here's Connie. Go ahead, Connie. Uh, yeah, thank you, ma'am. And so I was asking before the break that uh, when you have office hour. Oh, so um, it's during the same time my classes are, except on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, because I know that you have courses Sunday and Tuesday and when and Monday and Wednesday, but I know that. I I don't think that AUW has classes on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at that hour, 8 to 11. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, and there is another issue for me. Uh, there is a problem uh, in my NID card that I can't apply for vaccine. I tried like before uh, 7, uh, like around 5 or 6 different. I have trying my best to get it, but still it's not working. So today I will go with my dad to uh, Upozela office where like NID card, we talk about NID card and stuff. So I will go to Noapara with my dad and it's like uh, 10 kilometers away from my home. It will open at 10 o'clock. So now I have to take shower and take oh, my okay. breakfast. And All right. So 
Okay, very good, Connie. Um, that's fine. No problem. Yeah, so maybe Everyone? after break, I'll not be in the class. Yeah, and, and if you need to watch the video, that's fine. If you can write a good post without it, that's fine. I, I need to watch the video. I need to watch the video. Otherwise, I cannot get the idea. So I have to watch it. Okay. Okay. So we'll see you later. And everybody yeah. else, thanks for telling me. Everybody else will meet at 30 minutes after the hour for I don't know how many people are left, but not very many. So. Everybody who's still here should have a lot to say. We're going to talk about the dysfunctional family, the dysfunctional society. And then we're going to talk about the myth of catching up development, right? Deceiving the third world. All right, 15 minutes here. So we're talking about the article about dysfunctional society, dysfunctional families. And the main problem is the split between mind and body, which we learned in Kant, um, and how it creates psychic pain. It's very unnatural to deny your emotions, to repress your emotions, but we're disconnected from nature. And we really need to have this connection in our lives as part of our lives. And we don't have it. And so that psychic pain that's being caused, we distract ourselves and we dissipate our energies and we consume. Okay. So Ramisha, what about you? Did you have a reaction to that? Okay, she's going to write something in the chat box. Okay, Jamie, did you have a reaction? Is Jamie there? Oh, let's see, I have. Um, okay. All right, Moshe, did you have a reaction to either of these articles? So we did the um, advertisements and now we did dysfunctional families. So do you have a reaction? I don't have much to say, Professor, but I like the idea, for example, the dysfunctional families and for example, the family who is under underprivileged and they don't have much money, they always, you know, uh, depend like, you know, uh, responsible God that, okay, this God has given that life to the people and that way they are, you know, spending life. And also, Professor, one more idea, which is like the power of knowledge, for example, the, um, for example, the scientific, uh, you know, development, like the technology, or I think these are more, you know, applicable in this today's world, because uh, if you look at your country, US, which is like one of the most you know a powerful country and who says because of the you know development of our technologies and all and i think um for these reasons yeah these are more applicable professor i i don't have much to say all right so we were talking about the colonization of the mind um how much consumption is are people in developing countries they're trying desperately to be like Westerners, like they want the standard of life of a Westerner. They want to look like a Westerner. They want to talk like a Westerner. And that this is really contributing to the fact that nobody is doing anything to reduce the carbon footprint and it's getting even worse. So what do you think of that, Mosa? Yes, Professor, I do agree with you strongly because uh... Yeah, for example, uh, if we look at on European countries as they have, you know, more development and they have more, you know, power, money, and because of that, they have good standard of life. They have mentioned like a standard of life because if you have more money, then you have good standard of life. So, and because of that, even in Bangladesh, which is underdeveloped, underdeveloped country, and we have a lot of people, but if, uh, on the other hand, if you see that, you know, that a lot of people who have, you know, government, you know, employers, but they have a good, uh, you know, standard of life because they're making so much money and they want to follow, you know, the Western people because the way they are leading their life, the, even like, you know, 
um, the dresses and then you know the lifestyle and then also like uh, the languages for example the english we have our mother tongue which is bengali and then english now because we have a lot of you know english medium schools here and which is more expensive for example per month you have to pay two and three, uh, you know uh, two more than two lakhs so this is the underdeveloped country and then uh, the, here we, we will find this most expensive school so this, this concept they found from european countries right so and you know and like because of that uh, concept like the affluence the uh, european countries has so the uh, under development countries are as for example as bangladesh so they are just trying to follow that and then wants to make more money they're not, not doing anything you know to the uh, you know sustainable development related to the environment for example like if we are consuming more so we are going to develop more carbon footprint and then uh, for example like we are like we have a lot of garbage factories right in bangladesh and then they are producing a lot of you know uh, uh green like you know the gases and they're burning a lot of fuel a lot of sectors and then like so which has affected you know if you consume more, more so it, the the, the um, environment is going to affect more so no one is going to care about it they, they, they just care about themselves so how to make money and how to have a good standard of life as european has right and the problem is it's the air pollution is getting worse right so you're not getting a better standard of life except that you don't rank it based on clean air and drinkable water and right you base it on uh the size of your house and your car and your clothes right and so yeah that's the idea is that westerners don't seem to have to pay attention to air and water and um uh food and so literally people in developing countries even when the air and the water is so bad they won't pay attention to it because they're trying so hard to live this lifestyle right that's more yes, professor. <clears throat> i would like to add something which is like you know in previous semester not when i was in easy two i have taken a class which is named as environmental health and i found that you know in that course so due to you know air pollution in globally a lot of people will die so you know compared to other chronic diseases you know and then due to air pollution a lot of chronic diseases are happen are taking place no one is going to take up you know take care of, you know like uh, going to take yeah you know they're not giving the attention i'm saying that because like for example uh, due to in the covid 19 you have a lot of people have has died right but if you compare that you know uh, to other disease which are happened due to air pollution for example chronic diseases so these are much more higher but people are not you know aware about that so even professor like for example uh in my home village in my village town that a lot of people they are you know burning you know the um, what did they say that like it's not you know professor it's not oven electricity oven this is like something they're burning and then cooking you know, and they are, they, they, that, that, you know, that is, a, a, you know, producing so much, you know, CO2. And then what happened then? Like a lot, even the person is cooking, even if it is going to do, you know, she is going to do for a more long time, she has to have some chronic diseases, you know. So that's why, Professor, like, we have, we have to give attention to that thing compared to, like, you know, this in we, we, we need to you know work on these infectious diseases but we have to you know work on uh, you know air pollution and then sustainable development more like you know carefully because this causes more death than this this kind of diseases yeah okay um all right so then you also talked about um the power of knowledge but that is as opposed to when Bacon said, knowledge is power, right? Okay, so right. Um, when, yeah, all right. So when Bacon said knowledge is power, he said the whole point was to gain power over nature. And that's what Mr. Gore in the dysfunctional society is saying. Yeah, we do have power over it. And we're totally disconnected from it. 
and it's causing us all this psychic pain. And Bacon did not anticipate that. He wasn't thinking about that. He thought just because people would have a better material standard of life, that that, that would make them psychologically happy. And, he's, and Mr. Gore is saying, no, you know, this detachment from um, any sort of rhythms of nature or empathy or interconnection is, is really, really unhealthy. Um, does that make sense to you, Mosa? Yes, Professor. Okay. And it's just exercising this absolute power over nature and telling, you know, treating nature like silly putty for your projects. And this God somewhere is approving of this. Like, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Um, even religion isn't going to wake you up to, to this being any sort of problem. But that sort of God that controls you and you're going to, if you turn to the eternal, you'll go to heaven. And if you care about the temporal, like the earth, you're going to go to hell. That's evil. Then you have this God-like figure as the father of the family who just tells people, you follow my rules, no questions asked. And then uh, the children become really psychically unhappy and they, they depend on anybody for validation or approval. And, um, and then also this God, when applied to nature, you know, we have made ourselves into this kind of God and we exploit nature. And then when mother nature is suffering and abused and she tries to heal herself, and it turns out creating floods and hurricanes, this awful father God, oh, we got to control you more. Like your note, you're not conforming to what, right? And so we nice. got to find more knowledge, get more power. And so, and that, you know, that's even more dysfunctional. People even get more detached and then they have to distract themselves, right? Um, so that, that's kind of the idea. Um, so I hope you understand that, just kind of that Hi. dynamic, right? Okay, let's see, Ramisha says, I would like to talk about patriarchal society, my country. Families are basically based on the father. We have to obey his rules uh, because, but now it's changing because I, because I think mother and father, both of them should have equal rights in the family, education can change this nowadays and more girls are entering universities. But yeah, that's, that's good. It's just that we then we have to add this other thing is that when women and men finally do get some, the husband and wife get some equal uh, say, do they just go and both of them together go and exploit nature? and aim for a higher material standard of living, right? So that's another layer of treating nature like just something to exploit. So maybe you could get over the exploitation of your wife. Well, what about the exploitation of nature? So, um, so that's where he's seeing an analogy there. Um, let's see. Jamie, do you have a reaction to the dysfunctional society article? Uh, Raihana? Shamima? Sauda? Yes, Professor. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Um, sorry, uh, Professor, I just got back. So are we uh, discussing any particular? Yeah, the second article? one, the dysfunctional society. So the idea, you remember when we studied Kant and we studied Augustine. So Augustine's model of religion is that through math, we can figure out there's eternal laws 
uh, God created the universe according to eternal laws. We can know those laws and, the, and we should act on the basis of the eternal. And if we turn toward the temporal, which is the earth, that's dirty and nasty and sinful, right? So the only purpose of the earth is for us to use our reason to exploit it, to make our lives better. And the same with Kant, we have this disembodied mind, this split between mind and body. And we've created a culture where we are disconnected from nature. And Mr. Gore says that's psychic pain. It's not natural. There's this constant psychic pain in the back of our minds. And we, we deal with the pain by distraction, dissipation. So I was thinking with your nephews, um, Mr. Gore is saying it's adults who are running away from fears of failure or intimacy. But if your nephews are formed on this, right? They're not running away from anything. This is all they know. So their character is being formed in this way that's really one constant distraction, right? Yeah. And well, so the, go ahead. So it's just the environment that they are in, that's all they know. So is that, do you think that will cause psychic pain? Do you think that's just unnatural and it will come back to haunt them? Like you can't really live a life that way. I mean, to call it unnatural, I mean, isn't it like always unnatural to the older generation when we see the newer generation in a different environment and growing up in with you know because when we were kids we would hear our parents that like we didn't have internet or we had, didn't have phone and you guys are all having all have phones and just like this generational gap so i don't know if i would call the environment unnatural this it's just society changes environment right. changes and right. we are either evolving we're always evolving whether it's for the <laughs> better or worse we, it could be know. devolving right it could be devolving yeah. um yeah so i don't think it's unnatural but i do think it's just uh it will have some if right now this current situation with this all lockdown and everything the environment that they have been in for the first past year it's almost two years now there will be some consequences it either i mean there must be some uh psychological like stunt in growth like emotional growth and some physical as well since they're always like cooped up in at the house and barely just doing anything except just on on their screen eating sleeping and using their phones and that's okay. it yeah okay so time will tell to some extent but definitely there's there is not a connection with the earth and so are they going to have any interest in lowering their carbon footprint, right? Is that going to be any part of their psychological orientation toward the world? Um, it's so that that's a problem, right? Does that make sense, Soda? Yeah, I mean, right now they seem like really detached from everything. Right. But uh, I don't know. I mean, they have that even though, like, even if they're cooked up in home and they still have, I mean, they, <laughs> well, it comes back to uh, internet again. So they still have their phones, right? So even though they don't, they're not experiencing it firsthand right now, uh, all the environmental issues or problems. They don't know enough about it or they, they're not experiencing it firsthand but they have their phones and 
there's they have ways to get to know about it they can see it even if they can't explain it firsthand they can see other people experiencing it and all the negative impacts that it's having they can just a, with a few clicks they can just search it and see what's going on right so maybe it it would touch them in that way it seems like you know the air pollution if it gets bad enough it's pretty obvious that's just not a matter of opinion right yeah yeah that will affect everybody and lack of water or mudslides or right something's gonna click and then the question is are we gonna want to regain some natural connection or are we just gonna want to have more and more control right um repress the things in nature what's our <laughs> attitude going to be yeah yeah i think it depends on the like not the majority but the people in power so if they keep trying to just distract like the people and if they just they don't like let go of their greed and start you know reforming everything then i don't think it would be easy to just unite people to reform it themselves okay if, if there is no help from the government or the people who are controlling everything people in power oh. Yeah, but a few disasters, a few major disasters might make a difference. I don't know. But um, maybe that's maybe. like the, yeah, that's the harshest. Then we will have to look up. I know. But, I mean, so that's the extreme situation that would take away all of the, uh, what should I say, curtains, I guess. In front, from in front of our eyes yeah it will we will have to open our eyes that will forcefully open our eyes and maybe to survive everyone will join and you know try right. to be um let's see fahima did you come up with something you said um you were going to write something in the in the chat but I don't, oh, maybe that was way back. Um, can you speak, Fahima, or you just um, don't have enough uh, juice? Anyway, so let's do the last one. The last article is just uh, very similar. I just wanted to emphasize that this was a major theme. People knew about this 30 years ago. And then also, are all development strategies assuming this anymore, right? How has the UN's development strategy changed? That would be an interesting paper. Um, at, at this time, 1993, this was the when the USSR collapsed, the Eastern European countries uh, became independent, but they were still trying to catch up environmentally. So, there were these political changes, but the attitude toward the natural world did not change. Um, the, uh, the other point is that the poverty in the way capitalism works, there has to be a colonized group. There have to be poor people because, um, because, it exploits resources, it exploits natural resources and human resources. That's how you compete with the other guy and that's how you end up on top. So um, all relationships, economic relationships in a capitalism are colonial. Um, the best way to keep the system going is to colonize the emotional and intellectual cognitive acceptance of the colonized, brainwash them. Um, so 
colonized people need to develop their own sense of identity. And that's what I hope AUW students do, right? They, they haven't been sent to AUW in order to become wannabe Westerners. <laughs> Uh, or just, you know, I mean, I'm, I think it's fine to be a feminist, but not a Western feminist, right? You'd be your own kind of feminist. Um, let's see. The people in affluent countries know they're responsible, but they don't do anything because they've got, they've structured their whole lives and everything, their way of life is just heavily dependent on fossil fuels. So they develop this blind hope that the colonized people can catch up or technology will get better. They keep assuming there's no limit to the natural resources and technology will save us. Um, externalizing the costs, right? That's how it works. Is that when somebody, um, this is where, uh, one of the columnists, Paul Friedman, he said, in the cost of gas, you should include the cost of the Iraq war, two trillion bucks. If you, you know, if you can include the real cost of having gas and oil, which is the cost of war, um, it would cost a lot more and people might want to change. So the system is based on denial about the real impact of what's going on. Um, they don't include the effect on the environment. They don't include money spent to um, reforest, right? To, to plant forests or to replace resources. It's just unlimited taking and never giving back. Um, they don't consider the the cost to the people who are underpaid, to people in developing countries who have these terrible impacts from air pollution, right? Um, respiratory diseases, they don't include that. Um, the, the size of an economy, how big it is, is not a good measure of the quality of life. You could have more workers and lower unemployment, higher employment, and still you have a lower quality of life. Um, all right, so again, what I wanted to say related to um, AUW is that the school doesn't pull you away from your communities in order to make you into these wonderful individuals, right? And they, they pull you away to get you to rethink, you know, what do you really want and how can you give back? So they want you to be leaders in developing a higher quality of life. They don't want you to be part of the problem of the best and the brightest uh, detaching themselves from their community uh, accomplishing individual achievement, uh, praising themselves for their individual achievement, uh, not looking back, then having a brain drain, right? Being um, isolated and indifferent. So um, if that were true, you can, you know, development can lower the quality of life in communities, but it doesn't have to and AUW is their mission statement. Definitely, that's not what it's about. Um, so for the next class, which will be the last class that has readings, right toward the end of this reading, it said that the external colonies um, are developing countries and the internal colonies are especially women. So the last article is about women and women's place in this process of development. So it's both environmentally destructive and women suffer more than men and people in developing countries more than developed. Um, at this conference, the presidents, people who get elected or if they wanna stay elected, 
They have to tell their people that they are wannabe Westerners because if they don't, they won't get reelected. It's sort of a standard agreement that if you can preach that to your people and you can actually achieve it to some extent, you will be a successful political leader. Um, but what's happened is this hasn't worked out so well. So 28 years ago, it was already failing and people were be feeling betrayed and fundamentalism was rising and nationalism was rising and using religion as a weapon. So people um, fighting against each other, developing animosity based on religion, ethnicity, race, um, within their country and between countries. So this is, you know, obviously 28 years later, it's gotten a lot worse. But I think it's good to read an article this old because it was starting a long time ago, but especially after the fall of the wall, when the Eastern Europeans thought, oh, capitalism, this will be great. And then they started to get sour. Um, and there are a number of books now about this. The um, Seduction of Tyranny. This one woman who was a major player in the political life of, I think it's Hungary. And she was wanting to promote, you know, after the wall came down, promote democracy. She had a lot of close friends who were disappointed. They thought they deserved better. And so they went and joined in with a very authoritarian leader. And so now Hungary has an authoritarian leader. And um, because of these people who were disillusioned. Now, that's one dynamic going on. But when that goes on, environmental destruction is just completely ignored. And um, authoritarian leaders are indifferent to environment or even blatantly in favor of exploiting the environment to convince the masses that they really care about the masses so that they'll get reelected. So they will put on this show of standing up to um, environmentalists who don't want you know, the people to make money off of their land, or they want people, to, environmentalists want to tell them how to use their land. So these rising authoritarian leaders are just ignoring climate change issues and getting a lot of political power for doing so. So, uh, so the conclusion is, that this myth of catching up, this one particular piece of this huge puzzle, um, just leads to further destruction, further exploitation of the third world, their natural resource and their human resources, further violence against women, and further militarization of men, because they, you're going to have wars for oil, for resources, for water, and you're also going to have just all this uh, decline in a standard of living where you're looking for someone to blame. You want to find a scapegoat. And some uh, power hungry politician will pick a scapegoat and then they'll go to war. Um, war at this point is often cyber war. And so it's not quite as obvious or as sexy, but it's definitely there. And, um, and it's a serious, right? Cyber war is serious war. It messes things up uh, a lot more than just boots on the ground war does at this point. Um, okay, so any other questions uh, or comments that students want to make at this point. I do want you on your posts to um, comment on these things. I, I hope that you can understand that this class all fits together. So we're into these paradigms 
and paradigm shifts from ancient to modern and now into systems thinking. Um, the, the Aristotle's virtues are an issue, the UN capabilities, that the UN is trying to cultivate the capabilities of people all the way, all around the world. But these articles are pointing out the problems with that and how, um, you know, all the problems with that. Then you had Bacon, knowledge is power, John Locke's view of property. These, these uh, philosophies are looming in the background. They're very powerful, even if people aren't aware of it. Kant, his dualism is very powerful psychologically and in terms of the culture. Utilitarianism, pleasure, pain, and happiness. Uh, punching people's buttons is very powerful. Uh, even if it, it's not the way the original people intended it to be. It certainly isn't turning out that way. Um, for a lot of people, Christianity is a major factor. And again, it's being co-opted by people who use the Bible, Genesis, to justify the exploitation of nature. There's Christian stewards. Um, I, th I think it's obvious that's a better reading of the Bible, and it's only because of industrialization that we've come to where we've come to, but it's not winning out, right? Fundamentalism is winning out over humanistic and environmentalistic versions of Christianity. Uh, Islam, this is where my students have to tell me, right? Are the humanistic and environmentally protective interpretations, versions, movement among Muslims? Are they gaining traction or are they losing traction? Is it the more supernatural, just turn to God, doesn't matter, God will decide what to do? Are those the views that are getting um, a lot more followers? Um, what about Buddhism? What about Hinduism? Um, this is the short quote about the colonization of the mind. Mr. Um, McAuley says that um, we have to break the back of the culture of India. He's very impressed with the culture. People aren't greedy, they get along. The people are of such a caliber, right? It's a high level of culture. So we're not going to be able to conquer this country unless we break the backbone, unless we colonize the mind, right? And it seems like they've succeeded, right? And that's where you all have to come in and say, no, no. Um, so he, he proposes that we replace her old system, her culture, and, the, and then convince these people that England is good and the West is good, they'll lose their self-esteem, their native culture. We will become what we want them to be, a truly dominated nature, uh, nation. And so, yes, that's what's going on. Um, then you have the article about the third world, about how deep ecology and wilderness protection is really a bunch of Westerners and then a, an elite class in the developing countries. And then I talked about climate change, biodiversity, the notion of rationality, that rationality is self-interest and we shouldn't care about the natural. Rational people don't care about preserving the environment, which is on the surface of it outrageous. But if you look at this intellectual history, it's the natural development of that history. Lifeboat ethics, the tragedy of the commons, we're gonna use it all up. Everybody has their own economic gain. So everybody keeps exploiting nature until pretty soon nature collapses and everybody loses. So we have to, you know, that's in the background and there's more data about climate change. And then, our economic system and our way of thinking that we've been trained in economics 
is just going 180 degrees in the other direction. Advertising goes in the other direction. Um, uh, dysfunctional society, deceiving the third world, all this stuff is heading in the wrong direction. And then the last essay will be about women. So yeah, in your final paper, you're gonna write my environmental ethic and it has to be your creative response, right? You have to get a vision of how you wanna live, how you wanna pull yourself out of this, how you're not gonna let yourself get sucked up, how you're gonna set an example for other people. And then also some piece of research, some aspect of what's going on. Um, so that I, just so you get informed because it's obviously important. So I will see you if uh, anybody else have a question or comment. I'll go over, you know, I'll, I'll ask each of you one more time and then I'll let you go. So Mosa, do you have a question or a comment? You're okay, okay. Um, Ramisha, do you have a question or a comment? No, Professor, thank you. Okay. Um, Jamie? How about Raihana? Professor, did, did you make me as, as present? Today what? I was going, today due to internet connection, electricity thing, I joined late. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and I I, I called, you know, I uh, put you as present. Yes, no problem. Um, let's see. Raihana, are you there? Okay. Yes, she's there. Yeah. She's Raihana there? Yeah. Uh, Ramisha. Okay. Oh, she already did that. Okay. Um, all right. What about Shamima? Do you have any other comments? No, Professor. Thank you. Okay. What about Soda? Um, about class, Professor, or in general? Well, I mean, just how, how the class fits together. Uh, it's pretty well, Professor. I can see the connection from the beginning till right now. So I think it makes a sense. Okay. All right. Oh, um, wait. Um, also, Professor, I wanted to ask. Um, so we have two uh, assign, assignment in, like, in the Google Classroom. So there's research paper and then final paper. Are they the same thing or? there's two paper you should read the syllabus but um yeah, yeah no, also, I, no i did a I mean, post i think the post explained it but just a sec um because uh, we had two paper right professor the first one and then the final one so no, i was actually had three papers um there was uh, one that was due after about three weeks it was called yeah. the legacy of the west um, and then you had um, 12 posts, and then you had a research paper that was 1,200 words and three sources, and then you had your final paper due August 1st. Um, all right. So that was in, um, that was okay. in the syllabus. Yeah. So the research paper is simi similar to our first paper. No, the first paper is just responding to the material in the class. Yeah. This research paper is something on your own. You're delving into some more particular issue and finding out what other people are saying about this issue. Uh, okay. And then uh, the final paper is another one where you're creating your own point of view.
Okay. Uh, okay, Professor. Uh, got it. Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, all right. I guess I'll, I guess I'll let you go, and I will see you. Oh my goodness. Okay, the last class is in two days, and then we have the during final week we meet on the twenty eighth to discuss your research papers and your final papers. That's instead of having a test, we're just gonna meet to discuss your papers. Professor, that means we don't have class Wednesday? Yes, we do. We have one more class. I said one more class. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> people hear, hear what they wanna hear. One more class, it's on the post. Um, <laughs> okay. All right, we'll see you. Take care. You too, Professor, and have a good yeah. day. I think it's night, Professor, right? Your country? Yeah, it's midnight, whatever. Okay, okay. then have a good yeah. counseling, Professor. Bye-bye. You have a good day. Bye-bye.